All right, I think we'll get started. Um, just so everyone knows, your videos are off um, and you can um, chat in the chat section of this uh, webinar, but um, no videos. So please do keep your videos turned off. Um, all right, we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event presented in partnership with the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Uh, on behalf of Northwestern University Press and Seminary Co-op, thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation uh, between writers and translators, Joyce Sanana and Paul April. Um, I'll start off, tell you a little about Joyce and Paul. Uh, Joyce Sanana is an award-winning writer and literary translator. Her translations include Henri Bosco's Malacroix, published by New York Review Books Classics, and Toby Nathan's A Land Like You, published by Sequel Books. A McDowell Fellow, she is the author of a memoir, Dream Homes from Cairo to Katrina, An Exile's Journey, and is a regular contributor to the blog Feminism and Religion. Her translation of Darbo's The Beast and Other Tales, Northwestern University Press, was awarded the 2019 Global Humanities Translation Prize by Northwestern University's Global Humanities Initiative. I have a copy of the book. <laughs> Um, and also I included a, a link to the book on Seminary Co-op's website in the chat, so please feel free to visit that link to purchase your own copy of the book. Um, and also um, about tonight's interlocutor, uh, Paul April. Paul is a translator, poet, and beekeeper who lives in an orchard northwest of Toronto. His translations of Jean Giano's Hill and Melville, a novel, have been published by New York Review Books. For Melville, he received the French American Foundation's Translation Prize in 2018. A third Giano, The Open Road, is forthcoming in 2021. April is currently retranslating Colette Cherry and La Fin de Cherie. And a few notes before we get started. Um, like I said, um, the link to the book is in the chat. Um, also, if you have questions for Joyce or Paul during the event, please include them in the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, and please don't include them in the chat. Uh, and at the end, we'll answer the questions that are included uh, in the Q&A. We'll try to get to all of them at the end. Uh, this event is being recorded and it is being live streamed on our Facebook page. Um, and a recording of this event will also be sent out to everyone who registered. Uh, book sales, as I mentioned for this event are provided by the Seminary Co-op Bookstores, the first not-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. Although the stores remain closed to the public right now, they are fulfilling orders through their website, semcoop.com. When you place your order, you can choose from shipping, delivery to local area codes, or curbside pickup. At semcoop.com, you can also check out the full lineup of their other events for which they are providing sales, and you can find various ways to help support this unique cultural institution. Um, and with that, Joyce and Paul, take it away. Thank you so much, Olivia. And um, first, I want to say to you, Joyce, uh, what a pleasure to join you to talk about something we both love so much. Um, I want to thank uh, Northwestern University Press for hosting the event and also the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. Um, so we'll start out. Um, I think the first thing that people might want to know more about, I certainly do, is who was um, José Darbo? Um, and, you know, how did you come upon him? Because I think it's fair to say he was not a household name, certainly not in the English speaking world or even in France. So yeah. um, please fill us in. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, so before I answer your question, I want to say a couple of thank yous of my own um, to get started. Uh, some of you know, I'm a relatively new translator. And I really want to thank the American Literary Translators Association for um, giving me their emerging translator mentorship a number of years ago and having as my mentor, Allison Waters, who's been an incredible um, help in everything I've done. And I also want to thank the Global Humanities Initiative and the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities for selecting this book as the Global Humanities Translation Prize for 2019. Um, I applied for it sort of just, just to apply for it and was stunned that um, the book was selected and delighted that it was selected. Um, their mission is to um, promote underrepresented 
and experimental literary voices from marginalized communities, um, important texts in non-Western traditions and languages. And so I'm really delighted that this book in Provençal was chosen. And finally, I want to thank Anne Gendler, my editor at Northwestern, who did an amazing job helping me bring this book into its current form. So Jose Darbo, um, who is he? I have a picture of him, which I would love to show you. Let's see if I can do that. Yes, that is Jose Darbo, looking very dapper. Um, he lived from 1874 to 1950, uh, was born in um, Provence. His mother, was a poet. She was one of the first poets um, in an organization called the Feli Brige, which was an organization founded in 1854 by Frédéric Mistral to promote the Provençal language and to uh, create a renaissance of Provençal literature. So Darbo grew up with that mother and that influence. Um, he was educated in Avignon. He studied law in Aix-en-Provence. He started writing poetry. He was beginning to have a little literary career in Aix. And then suddenly in 1897, when he was 23, he moved to the Camargue. And I'll talk about the Camargue a little bit as we go on, but here is a picture of him in the Camargue on horseback. Um, so when he was in the Camargue, he um, became a manadier. He had a, a, a herd of, um, of bulls, of black bulls, which he raised. Um, and he started writing just in Provençal, devoted himself to a kind of work of um, celebrating the life that is lived in the Camargue celebrating the people of the Camargue, celebrating the animals and uh, the landscape of the Camargue. Um, for 20 years, he was an editor. He was the editor in chief of a journal called Le Feu, which was um, the, organ, the organ of Mediterranean regionalism. So he was a very important figure in Provençal literature in the first decades of the 20th century. Um, here is, um, I wanna show you a little map. This is a map of the Camargue. Um, this is Arles, and this is the Rhone River coming down to the Mediterranean on one side and Le Petit Rhone on the other side. And here is the, um, the Baccarès. So let me, get out of this sharing for a moment. Okay, so um, he's still very much loved in the Camargue. You can find his books in the bookstores. Um, La Bête du Vacares, in this edition, this is the French edition published by Grasset, has never gone out of print, which is pretty amazing. It's first published in 1926, it's never gone out of print. It's been translated into Czech, Estonian, Portuguese, and German. Um, and this is not the first English translation. There was a translation in 1947, um, which was published in a small book of short stories from France. And it was translated very differently than the way I've translated it. So, that's a little bit about Darbo and how I came to know him is a very interesting story. So a few years ago, I was working on my translation of Malicroix by Henri Bosco, which is right here, published by New York Review. And um, that book is set in the Camargue. And I felt that in order to understand the book, I needed to be in the Camargue. I needed to know something more about the place. So I went there in um, the fall of 2014. And I stayed in an Airbnb with a woman who had a little house that was very much like the kinds of houses that the Guardians lived in. And I'll show you a picture of that later. 
And she said to me, if you want to know the Camargue, you need to read this book. And mm. she gave me La Bête du Vacares. And mm. I immediately started reading it. She also mm. took me around and showed me all kinds of places. So I read it and I didn't really get it or understand it very much, but I read it in French. And then uh, later on that same trip, I was in Nice in the Bosco archives and I was learning as much as I could about Bosco. And I came across an article talking about the influence of Darbo on Bosco. And then I came across an article by, by Bosco about Darbo, which was an amazing, amazing article. And it was called um, La Camargue et sa Poésie. Um, the Camargue and its poetry. And one of the first things he says in that essay is um, the Camargue turns every guardian into a poet. A guardian is the cattle herder. The Camargue turns every guardian into a poet. And then he went on to talk about Darbo and to say that no one until now, 1941, has proclaimed the merits sufficiently of this profound and serious poem, entirely dreamed and yet carved by such a firm hand in such precise characters on such a hard rock. Wow. So, and he goes on to say more remarkable things about um, La Bête du Vacares. So with that in my mind, I went back to reading it again. And on my second reading, I started to fall in love with it. And I was also at the same time falling in love with the Camargue. And it just seemed like something that needed to be done, something that needed to be translated. So. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I have a question about his biography. Um, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like the Kamar could also turn a poet into a guardian because he, yeah. like, what precipitated this dramatic change in his life? It's very unusual. Yeah, yeah. Um, There were a lot of things, I think. So he was, he was already a follower of Mistral and already committed to um, this revival of Provencal literature. And there was a, and, and he, there was an idea that the Camargue was the place that had most kept the old traditions of Provence, that it was the place that was the least affected by the centralizing, you know, monolithic French culture. Um, and that the guardians, the, the cattle herders, were, you know, in this long, this ancient tradition of um, revering the animals, revering nature, living in harmony with nature, and so on. So I think uh, going to the Camargue was the way to live out his already formulated poetic ideals, literary ideals. Um, and also he had a cousin uh, named Folco de Baroncelli, who had moved to the Camargue some time before that, and who was uh, also a writer, a kind of a folklorist, um, a, a sort of um, developer of the myth of the Camargue in a way. And um, so Baroncelli encouraged him to come, helped get him set up as a manadier. And um, yeah, so he was part of, part of the scene part of the scene that he was uh, interested in. Let me show you, I have a picture, I think, of Baroncelli. Yes, that's Baroncelli on his white horse with his black cattle, looking also very dapper. These guardians were very dapper men. They still are, they're still around um, and they still look like that. And Baroncelli actually codified 
this outfit that they wear. And so there you go. Wow. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. So maybe we can turn now to um, the novella itself. Um, could you tell us what you think are the central aspects of it, the themes, the, the meanings of it? There's so much. Um, I don't know how to begin. Um, so let me say that I think it's just a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. And one of the things about it, one of the things that drew me to it is um, the simplicity with which it's written and the modesty of the narrator. So, so the book, for those of you who don't know it, um, it's purported to be the journal of a guardian who lived in the 15th century, who um, uh, encountered uh, a, a creature that he uh, could not come to terms with, right? Could not figure out what it was, who it was, what, it, what was going on. And so the journal is the record of his um, encounter and his struggle between fear and, and love, actually. Um, so the creature that he meets one day is a creature that is half man, half goat. And we who are reading the book, and this is one of the things that's so interesting to me, right? That the perspective of the narrator is a limited perspective. He's a 15th century Catholic guy who doesn't have that much education. He has some education, but not that much. So um, he did not read the classics apparently. Um, um, he was church educated, but he didn't read the classics. So he, he meets this creature, which has the horns of a goat, um, the face of a man, the torso of a man, and the body of a goat. And of course, cloven he hooves. thinks, <laughs> cloven yes. hooves, it has cloven hooves. And so he thinks that he's encountered the devil. Um, and yet this devil speaks to him and this devil um, reaches out to him in a variety of ways. And we can talk about that. Um, and he's attracted to it. And so the whole novel is the, the, the story of this movement between that attraction and that horror. And so I just find that fascinating. And I think it's interesting on so many levels. I think it's, it could, you could think of it as, um, you know, anyone's encounter with something other that they don't know how to put into a conventional category, right? Um, and, and this creature, you know, does not fit into his categories. Um, and yet he ultimately does come to embrace it in a sense. Um, so that, that to me is fascinating. And of course, um, the other, to me, very exciting thing about the book is that it is um, suggesting pretty strongly um, the importance and validity of um, the pagan deities of the old nature gods and showing uh, how much we lose when we lose our connection with them. So I think that's one of the biggest things um, that is presented in this book. Um, one of the things that I really like about the book too is it has footnotes. Um, yeah. that Darbo, Darbo put his own footnotes into the text. And I think the footnotes are kind of funny. Some of them are very funny, I think. Um, but they, one of my favorite parts of the book is actually in a footnote. So I'm gonna read this footnote if I can, or sure. just find. Um, so um, he's mentioned in the text, he's mentioned um, that in the Camargue, there is something called la vieo vie danso, means the old dancer. And um, here's the, what the footnote says. The old dancer, 
the way people in the Camargue refer to mirages. Mirages are common in the Camargue, especially around the Vacares, which is that big lagoon. Excuse me. They begin with a vibration in the air, a trembling that runs along the ground and seems to make the images dance. It spreads into the distance in great waves that reflect the dark thickets. How not to see in this mysterious viejo, dancing in the desert sun, a folk memory of the untouchable wild goddess, ancient power, spirit of solitude, once considered divine, that remains the soul of this great wild land. So there, I think Darbo is speaking to us as himself. Um, and he's telling us something about his view of the Camargue, of this ancient goddess that is still the soul of this great wild land. Um, so while the Guardian struggles to come to that perspective, um, we're told it within the first chapter if we read the footnotes. So that's one of the things I really love about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the stages of um, the narrator's responses to the beast? You know, uh, how he comes to understand the beast and how the, 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 the novel novella comes to a climax, in fact, um, for me is, is really astounding, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the dimensions of that. So um, the way he comes to know the existence of the beast at first is through some uh, tracks that he mm -hmm. sees um, in the sand. <clears throat> They're called clavo. Um, which can also mean key. Um, so he he comes across these tracks and, and they're tracks of something he's never seen before. And he, he wants to find out what it is. And so he starts looking for it. And um, his, his horse also reacts pretty strangely when they come upon the, the vicinity of the creature. Um, so yeah, so the first time he meets him, he sees him. Um, I can read a little, should I read a little bit of that? I can read a little bit of that section. Um, let me just find it. Okay. It was not that the animal looked as dreadful as I had feared. Through the tangled reeds, I barely made out hindquarters covered in coarse, tawny gray hair. I saw two feet with cloven hooves, which I could easily identify. But what stunned me most was glim glimpsing a sort of rough swaddling cloth plastered to its back and loins. So there's like a modesty about this. Yeah, that's and rather funny, actually. Pretty funny. It's very funny. Um, squatting motionless on its heels, the beast presented neither its forelegs nor its head. Afraid to startle it if I tried to approach it again and feeling my horse rigid with fear beneath me, ready to put up a fight if I goaded him, I decided to hail this strange creature to make it turn and look at me. So he hails it. But I had barely finished my second call before I felt my hair stand on end under my hood and an icy sweat stream down my spine. I had to clutch a handful of mane to keep from fainting. The head turning toward me had a human face. It was me shivers. Read it yeah. a few times. And then, and then he sees the horns and he's like completely horrified. And so he tries to exorcise it. So he says some words in Latin um, that he thinks will get rid of a demon. And of course they have no effect. And the first words that the creature says are, human, do not be alarmed. I am not the devil you dread. You are Christian, I can see that. You are Christian, but I am not a devil. <laughs> so great, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. and you know, so it's a he's a very smart creature, and 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 the beast then goes on to say, 
you know, to worry that now that he's encountered the guardian, that now he's endangered because his experience is that when humans in the 20th century, well, in the 15th century, and even in the 15th mm, century, mm. come across him, they uh, persecute him. Mm. And he's terrified that the guardian will harm him. Um, and he says, you know, this is, this is the, the last place where I could live freely. This is the last place where I could breathe the air and smell the sea and, you know, find a little bit to nourish myself. And am I now going to lose that because you've seen me, you've come face to face with me. And so Jean, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Go ahead, no. No, no, I'm just gonna say, Jean, his name is Jean, the guardian. guardian. Yeah. Yeah. He gradually learns that the, the beast has quite a range of emotions. So I'd oh, yeah. in his face. And so is it fair to say he, he starts to develop uh, compassion for the beast? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a couple of things happen. I mean, at one point he realizes that the beast is hungry mm -hmm. and um, that he's digging for roots to eat, that there's not much, it's winter and there's not much that he can eat. And Jomi has some nuts and some figs and bread that he's put in his pocket that day and he gives them to the creature and the creature takes them and 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 looks at him with you know incredible gratitude and 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 cries and um the guardian then you know is deeply 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 moved by that and also still troubled so he he goes home and he he you know he's like in a fever he has nightmares he just he you know because he still thinks maybe it is the devil and so he's just yeah tormented hmm. for quite some time hmm. yeah it's remarkable you know in some it's ways um, I mean, it, it, the, the, the novel is called The Beast, and it's, you know, the beast is really the main subject, but at the same time, it's so much an exploration of the mind of Jean, Jean May, I gather it's pronounced Jean. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. It really is about him, and it's mm. about us. I mean, it's mm. about us. Yes. Um, encountering something the other that we no, no. know how to, how to come to terms with. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. well, there's a lot of ways you can configure that. It's amazing. So as I mentioned earlier, and I hope that you'll read from that passage as well, Joyce. Mm -hmm. After the, the central God, passage. Yes, you know, he's, he's had many encounters with the beast. And I can't remember if he started to wonder if the beast has disappeared or not. But anyway, um, this, it, it, this, this, indescribable event takes place that he witnesses and um i hope that you'll talk about it and read from that yeah. section yeah. so you know the other interesting thing that i didn't realize until after i'd been working on the book a while is there are not that many encounters with the beast there are three mm -hmm. um and um and then there's this one this last one um and and the beast has not been around for a while and he's been worried about him and trying to find him. And so he goes through an elaborate preparation of um, sort of going out one night and um, hiding behind a bush. And while he's there, he notices that one of his bulls is coming through the night to this place where he is and he's a little surprised by that but he thinks well maybe you know he's it's springtime he's going out searching for a female you know he's just leaving leaving home looking for someone um, and then another bull comes and another and another and another and he starts seeing his whole herd of bulls coming through the night it's a night with a full moon as well um, so let me just read a little bit. Um, so as they waded through the lagoon, 
All the beasts I observed seemed to be following a well-marked trail. They plodded along at a steady, even pace, as they do in the morning when I lead them to drink, or when, driven through the marsh, they smell the scent of fresh reeds in the air. So he then follows the bulls, and he comes to this place where there is a clearing. And here is what he says he sees. Um, <clears throat> Suddenly my blood ran cold and my whole body turned to stone as if the earth had opened under my feet and I had heard from the four corners of the universe the trumpet blast on judgment day. I, Jomé Roubaud, the pockmarked, saw these things during the hours of that night. First, pushing aside the tamarisks that hid the land from me, I saw the immense salt flat and the calm distant lagoons shimmering as always in the moonlight. But soon after, distraught as I was, I recognized the beast. Upright and naked, he was standing on what we call an oturo, a flat knoll covered with short grass, while all around him, a live black throng wheeled in an endless swirl. Thanks to the moonlight, I could see gleaming backs, wild eyes, shining horns. Nearly all the wild bulls of the Camargue must have been there. And minute by minute, from all ends of the horizon, I could see new bands approaching. First, from far away, I would see a moving shadow swell as it slid beneath the moon. Then, all of a sudden, a manado would appear, the bulls, ceaselessly trotting, muzzles down, heads swaying as they plunged into the circle. I saw my 270 bulls mingle and vanish like waters from mountain streams that flow into the Rhone and disappear. And the circle continued to grow to form a dark teeming cluster around the beast, like a swarm of bees that lured from their hive by spring's thirst intermingle in love's madness. That's when I realized that the beast, upright at the center, was mastering the bulls by his own power and whim. I felt his will summoning the bulls from a distance, driving them across marshes and plains, blowing into their blood this frenzy that swept them away. Beneath their wild trampling, the battered sensorio seemed a huge threshing floor. I saw a few more of these late troops as they arrived. Always and without stop, they whirled. More and more quickly, it seemed, from moment to moment, more and more quickly. As he raised his arm, so dry and so black, the beast, with brisk signals, drove the train. Maddened, they flung forward with his gestures, as with lashes of a whip, he harried them. The more quickly they whirled, the more the circle seemed to widen and spread around him. Mm. And it goes on. Yeah. <laughs> it goes on. Well, and then he, it, then he, he starts playing a flute. Yeah. And he or a, a reed, and he plays the reed, and they, they're dancing, they're whirling. Becomes in rhythm with the music, mm. and he's. He got them to stop and go in one direction and then go in the other direction. And yeah. A transcendent it's passage. Quite, it's it's a beautiful scene. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the last time we see the beast, actually. Yeah. It has a kind of cosmic force, I think. Um, yeah. And it's at that moment when the beast, um, who, who we might already, though Jomé would not have known him, recognized him as a sort of figure of Pan, the, the Greek woman god. Right. When he pulls, when he brings out his reed, I think that's the clincher. <laughs> that's the it's clincher, the, yes. The, 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 yeah. the searing. I, let me just say one more thing. And, and so one of the things that I think is delightful about the book is that all the way through, Jomé is saying, 
you know, I'm writing these things. I don't understand what happened, but maybe somebody later will understand what happened. <laughs> yes. Okay. Maybe I'm yes. writing this for the reader who one day will interpret my experiences for me because I don't understand them. Anyway, That's yeah. almost like Darbo was being a bit arch, you know. <laughs> oh, so, quite. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Extremely, yeah. Extremely. Yeah. Extremely. Well, thanks so much for. Um, recounting all of that, Joyce, and reading. It's, it's just um, magnificent. Um, shall we talk a little bit now about what it was like to translate this work? Um, it, it, it's so, I mean, we've, you've already mentioned more than once that the, the narrative ostensibly takes place in the 15th century, so already it's displaced in time and already it's displaced in, in space from uh, what we're familiar with. It was written at first in Provençal and then translated into French by Darbo himself. And then you went about rendering it into English. Um, so there's so many different uh, streams coming together. How did, you, how did you manage that? And what, what, what were the biggest challenges you faced? Well, I mean, um, I don't know that I managed it, um, but there were many. <laughs> well, you did. You finished the translation. <laughs> I don't know that I managed it exactly. Um, yeah. So let me say that initially I started translating it from French. I didn't know any better. I didn't really know. I didn't know anything about Provençal really when I started, and I had been given the book in the, in the bilingual edition and. I thought, well, I, I read French, so I'll read it in French. And, and then when I decided I wanted to translate it, I initially naively was gonna translate it from the French. Um, but the edition, I don't know if you can see, this is, this is the, the original edition. There's the Provençal on this side and the French on that side. And so I was working from the French and periodically I would look across at the Provençal and Provençal looks a lot like French. It looks recognizable. Um, it's a Latinate, it's a Romance language. Um, and so initially I, I thought I could read it, I couldn't. Um, but I could see that some of the words were similar words and I could see that some of the words were really, really different words. Um, and I became curious about what was going on there, really curious. And especially as I got to know Darbo a little better and understand his deep commitment to Provençal, I felt as if the only way to really do a proper translation would be to try to get close to the Provençal. So um, I kind of, what I did was I, I sort of used the French as a crib, you know, as my like guide. And then I would go back to the Provençal and look up all the words. Um, I looked up all the words. Yeah, um, that's what we do. And, <laughs> um, and what, helped me to do that was this amazing thing, this amazing resource that's available online called Le Trésor du Félibrige, the Dictionnaire Provençal Français, which was published in 1878, put together after 20 years of work by Mistral, um, a, a thorough dictionary of Provençal and a really wonderful dictionary, really, really beautiful dictionary um, because all of the entries, many of the entries are quite long and they give variants. They often give um, uh, literary examples. Um, so there's a whole lot of context um, that comes. And so I spent hours just you know, losing myself in, in the dictionary and um, exploring um, how to find a way to, to 
to put it into English. Um, <clears throat> in the introduction to the book, I talk about some of the differences that I noticed um, between the French and the English, and there were there were quite a few. Um, I, I, today, I came up with a couple of examples that I thought could- You mean between the French and the Provençal? I'm sorry, sorry the French and the yes. Provençal, yes. Yes, The obviously. Provençal and the French. So this is towards the end of the book. Um, the narrator um, is speaking about how long time is seeming when he's trying to track down, trying to find the beast. Now he's looking for the beast to try and help him. Um, so in Provençal, he says, les journado non geste de fin. And then in French, les journées sont interminables. So we can understand maybe the, the days, the, the Provençal, um, the days did not have an end. And the French is the days are interminable. They don't have an end also. But the French is a lot heavier, I think, than the Provençal. And so I said the days are endless rather than the days are interminable. And if I had just been translating from the French, I'm not sure what I would have done. Mm -hmm. I probably might have ultimately ended up with the days are endless anyway. But here I knew that I was sticking closer to the Provençal. Does that make sense, Paul? It makes perfect sense, but it's a tricky one because, you know, we're always uh, tempted to fall into the trap of what we call um, false friends, um, you know, but in fact, interminable is not a false friend. It actually does mean the same as endless. I mean, it means exactly the same, but it feels yeah, very different. It feels very different. So you would have to have um, a kind of strategy. You would have to have decided that you were going to try and move away from the Latinate in order exactly. to make that choice if you had only had the French. And I really exactly. admire that you, well, no, I, I mean, I understand it's, a, it's, it's to have had the Provençal to lead you in that direction was, was a great um, benefit. Very fortunate. And so here's another one. Um, and, and so, you know, what's funny or what's interesting, I guess, is that Provençal is, a language derived from the Latin, of course, right? But it somehow seems less Latinate <laughs> than yes. literary oh, French. Yes. So it's totally. like literary French picks, does something different with its own heritage than Provençal does. And I don't want to say that Provençal is a, you know, non-literary language, because it is a literary language. Um, but it, it just has a different kind of feel to it. Would it, um, would it be fair to say that it's more earthy? I think it would be fair to say that it's more earthy. Um, I would think it is fair to say that. Um, <laughs> and it's, That was it's a leading very, question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's very, um, what's the word, um, graphic. Uh, mm. Sometimes images are often, it has lots of images that are very concrete images. So it's very concrete as opposed to abstract. That I think is a big difference between- you Want to them. talk about the second yeah. example that you have? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the second one is he's talking about um, anxiety, anguish that is troubling him now that he's trying to find the beast. Um, mais, my nest pa, pas la memo quantan empoisonado mi jour that's the Provençal. Mais ce n'est point celle qui autrefois rendait mes jours et mes nuits intolérables. I mean, you can just hear the difference, I think, just mm. listening to it. Um, so again, in the French, he's saying uh, something was making his days and his nights intolerable or, you know, unbearable. Maybe I would have said if I just had the French. Um, but in the Provençal, he says it poisoned my days and my nights. So all I had to do in English is say it poisoned yes. my days and my nights. Well, and, and that um, it, it's it's a more accurate rendering. I think so. I think so, arguably, and, but and, it, it's and 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 so the question for me is like, why did Darbo 
mm. write that kind of French. He didn't have to write that kind of French. He could have said, mes jours et mes nuits étaient empoisonnés. He could have said that. Mm. Um, so there's a doesn't. sense that he was sort of giving it a bit of a facelift or, you know, mm, cosmetic in a way, I suppose, with the, with the audience in mind, but it's a, it's a pity because um, it strikes me too in that example, Joyce, that in the Provençal, there was a word en temps. I don't know how they would have pronounced it, but that word mm -hmm. exists in French and yes. it means the same thing, les jours d'antan, yes, yes. le temps yes. d'antan, it means the autrefois. So he, he yes. took that beautiful word, which is stronger really, mm -hmm. And yes. shifted it to autrefois. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean he really, um, you know, and and it's almost like I don't know that he was um, trying to accommodate his uh, Parisian audience, or or maybe he was trying to really show that the Provençal was stronger than the French. I don't know. Oh. I don't know. That's that's my little speculation. Theory. That's yeah, not too bad we can't ask him. No, it is <laughs> um, bad we yeah. can't ask him. Yeah, now listen, um, well, the time, of course, has flown. Um, and I'm not sure. I know that there, 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 there are probably going to be questions, and, and I hope that we'll be able to get to them. I'm not seeing them yet myself, but I think I will be able to momentarily. But just before we do go to questions, um, mm. and certainly if there's anything else that you really wanted to add, Joyce, please do. But um, can you say just a bit more about, I mean, um, the place of, of, of uh, the beast in 20th century literature? Um, I mean, obviously your translation is, is helping to enhance that. So you and I have talked about this, of course. Um, by the way, I can see the questions. Can you not see the oh, questions? I, maybe I have to. You have to minimize. click on Q and A down at the bottom. Um, but anyway, um, I can do that if we need to. Um, okay. So I, I mean, I think he's part of a larger movement um, of uh, you know a, you might call it like a romanticism in the twentieth century. A, 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 a seeking to af assert um, the importance of the natural world and of you know instinctive life and so on that um, a number of writers, um, D. H. Lawrence. Um, I saw somebody asking a question in the chat about E. M. Forster. Um, you know, were were pursuing. Um, I know for sure that he was an enormous influence on Fosco. Um, and you and I have talked about how it's very likely, very likely that he was an influence on Jeannot. Um, and so I think he, and his style um, is, a, is a very interesting style. Um, we didn't talk about the stories. Um, so this edition also has three of his short stories or tales that were originally published in a volume called La Caraco. Um, and those stories are actually a little bit different. They're set not in the 15th century. They're set in the present. Um, and they're written in this very spare, clean, um, if you will, mo kind of modern style um, that I think very, that we see in other writers of the time. So that's what I have to say. Great, sorry if I seemed a bit distracted. I'm trying to catch up with the questions and there are some excellent questions. So should we turn to them now? Sure, Not? sure. sure. Okay. Um, so uh, here's a question from Elaine Hyman. Um, but don't you think, Dr. Zanana and others who have read it, that the central conflict suffered by the main character is between the ingrained Christian conscience and the life force of the beast, which is dying and becomes in the final pose of the sinking beast, a Christ? 
Mm. <laughs> it's a rich question. Oh, I never thought of that. Thank you, Elaine. Well, um, yeah. hmm. So he's a Christ who's killed by Christianity. Hmm. But he becomes but, a tree. He becomes veg. It's a vegetal um, image at the end. Yeah. He's not a crucified yeah. beast. Yeah. But but there's there's these two pieces sticking up from mm. the water. Yeah. So there is that kind of image. Um, yeah. I lost you, Paul. Wait, what? No, I'm sorry. I'm just saying that. Well, I can. You know, I understand the question. It's an excellent question. But I think the image at the end, if I may partially try to answer it, is is that that the beast has be, is is described in in vegetal terms. It's becoming. Mm something more like like the the trunk of a tree with some branches sticking rather than the horns have become am i right or is it well yeah i mean the horns he thinks he doesn't know what it is he just right he see he sees something and it looks to him and the guardian sees something and it looks to him like the stump of a tree but yes. he also right. worries that it might be that it might be the beast he never says that he never articulates that but um, yeah, he's he's perceiving it the way he knows how to perceive it, actually. Um, and Anne Gendler, I see Anne Gendler saying, "But the cross no, but is a kind of tree." Of course, this She's is right. true. Absolutely, it's absolutely Ab true in a absolutely. somewhat form. So the question is very, um, very pressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But I, but I think um, it's wonderful. Yeah, go ahead. No, there's another another little translation thing at the very beginning, the very first time he doesn't quite see the beast um, in, uh, he sees something slipping through the reeds. And in French, it's an etre, a being. And in the Provençal, it's something V-I-E-U, something view. Um, and what that word means is something alive, something vibrant. It also means the heart of a tree. Mm. It can also be the heart of a tree. So, and then later when, when the beast is, is withering away, he says, um, I'm like, he says something like, I'm like a tree that can't draw any energy anymore from the sap, you know, so. So mm -hmm. the tree image goes all the way through the text, actually. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. But yes, so the conflict is between this uh, Orthodox Christian worldview and something that challenges that worldview um, that gets destroyed, yes, by it. Mm -hmm. But is... But oh, so maybe Elaine is suggesting that that the beast can become a new Christ, can be <laughs> the uh, source no. of another, I mean, there, there, another religion. I don't be know. Consistent yeah. with the notion yeah. that the yeah. death of Pan was the death of the of the pagan, the whole the, the, of, of pantheism, and that it you know ushered in the, yeah. the Christian era, but. Yeah. But in presenting it so poignantly and presenting it in the terms that Darbo is presenting it, he's not just lamenting it, but maybe offering um, a future. And yes, very much. And as you, you know. said, it's 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 left the ambiguity that he leaves is is very poignant. Yeah. 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 It's it's certainly not um, a kind of cavalry <laughs> that any the, any like anyone that we know. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Moving to another question. This one from an anonymous attendee. I'm guessing that the bull on the cover is not the beast, since the right. beast is more goat. Well, is a goat, in fact, more goat, well, part goat than a bull. What is the relationship between the beast in the story and the bulls that the guardian tends? Can they communicate with one another? Well, I mean, I guess in that scene, we see that the, the scene that I read, we see that the beast is um, mastering the bulls, which is quite extraordinary, right, actually, to think about it, like, how do you master a bull? 
Um, it's a pretty hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but the beast has managed to do that. Um, the, the bull on the cover is just the bull on the cover. Um, there are lots of bulls around in the text, um, but he's certainly not um, the beast. Um, some, it's interesting. Uh, I just, I will mention something. I have another little book here that I wanna show off for a second. Um, there is this book, I think I can see it. It's called Lu Biu, the Bull. Um, and it was, it's a poem that was written in 1924 by Baron Selly, um, the person I mentioned before. And it's, it's a fabulous little poem and it probably had a, an influence on Darbo because it's a poem about a guardian who's hanging out by himself next to the, next to the lagoon. And one day this huge bull appears and starts talking to him and telling him that he is, um, you know, that the bull himself is, you know, the representative of this great race and of this divinity and so on and so forth. And that the guardian is doing this holy job of caring for the bulls and living this wonderful life in the Camargue and um, resisting the uh, encroachment of civil, of uh, yeah, modern civilization on this region. So this is a poem in which the bull is the beast, um, but here um, Barrow did something a little different. Yeah. Okay, one final question. Um, this yeah. is from, from Harry. Can mm -hmm. you talk about the other stories in the collection and their relationship to each other? Why did you choose those particular stories to round out the volume? Yeah. So I think, um, well, they, the, the other stories were published as a group um, themselves in a volume called La Caraco um, the same year that um, The Beast of Vacares was published. So relationship. Um, they're all stories in which the main character is a guardian, a bull herder. They're all stories in which the guardian is confronted by something challenging and different that, um, uh, you know, opens up in some way his world. And um, in each case, the guardian uh, fails to um, do what needs to be done, I guess, is what I can say. Um, loses, loses something that he loves. Um, and I think that's what happens at the end of the beast and it happens in, in those three stories. And so um, there, it's actually a very, in some ways a very sad collection of stories, um, but also suggesting the possibility of not behaving the way the guardians behave. So I, I like it for that reason. And we actually do have time for maybe a couple more. And, and there, there are a couple that are very germane to what you've just been saying. And they come from our Emiliano Carni. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. So first uh, he asks, do the short stories reveal the same richness of place and in brackets locale mm -hmm. as the beast? And he goes on to, uh, to say, I ask about the sense of place because with Henri Bosco, like his contemporary Jean Giono, both are masters of the quote, regional unquote French mm -hmm. literature, writers who dwell mm -hmm. above all on the grandeur, beauty and ferocious unpredictability of the natural world. Absolutely. So partly, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, yes, um, the other the other stories are very much um, give us uh, the place and um, and nature, weather, 
weather. There's weather <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. there's the landscape, there's the animals, um, there's the relationship between the human and the animal and the vegetable and the mineral. So yes, it's all all there in those stories. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. done with a very fine hand, a sort of, I think a little different from, quite different from the descriptions in Bosco. Um, and I think also different from the descriptions in Jono. Um, mm -hmm. They're more uh, restrained, but but they're very strong, nevertheless. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. so much, Joyce. I think you've given us all <laughs> more than just a taste. I mean, really an almost visceral experience of this in incredible work. And um, so this is yeah. Oh, ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, there it is. <laughs> it's worth, worth more, than a to, more than a thousand. I wanted to see the landscape, right? Um, and here's Here's the the Vacares Lagoon with with its uh, flamingos. Oh. So we needed to see that. And here's here's Cocteau's version of of uh, mm. the fawn. And so mm. anyway, just yeah. Uh, well, bon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, I hope you'll read the book if you haven't read it yet. And thanks. And um, and there's more Darbo to be translated. So mm. we'll say that too. Yeah. Thank you, Joyce and Paul, for this wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone who attended this event. Um, as I said, please visit the Seminary Co-op website uh, to purchase your own copy of The Beasts and Other Tales. Um, thank you again. And good night, everyone. Thanks good night. so much. <laughs> Thanks. Good night. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. Bye.